Thanks for joining us at Dream City Online. Stay connected by downloading the Dream City Omaha app. And don't forget to subscribe for all our latest videos. How's everybody doing today? Good. Those of you that are here in person, those of you that are watching online, thank you for being with us. It's so good to so good to be here together in God's house, worshiping, gathering in his name, thankful for the freedoms that we have to be able to do that. And God, may we not take that for granted. May we not take it lightly. Um, but it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, if you have your Bibles and you want to you get a, a, a head start on everybody else, is where we're going to be for our reading today. Um, before, we, before we do, how many of you guys have little kids at home? How many of you have, have grandkids at home that are little? How many of you at one time had little kids at home? How many of you have ever spent any time with any little kids? Okay, awesome. Those of you that haven't raised your hand yet, we'd like to get you some exposure to that. So if you want to see Pastor Sarai, we'd love to have you serving in our kids' ministry. But uh, when you're with little kids, you know, little kids are, are, are fun. Little kids are challenging. They're, you know, it's, it's, you never know what you're going to get kind of by the minute. Um, but, but I love playing with little kids. And when, when my kids were little, when my daughter was young, one of her favorite games to play was peekaboo. How many of you guys ever played peekaboo? Come on, you know, you hide your face and then what do you say? Peekaboo. Have you ever, have you ever got hurt playing peekaboo? Have you ever had an accident playing peekaboo? You know, if you, if you ever, and this is just, this is just for your benefit. If you ever get hurt playing peekaboo, we know where you need to go. To the ICU. I see you. I see you. All right, that's fine. You didn't like that one. We'll try again next week. Second Corinthians chapter one. We better get in the word this morning. I was, as we were going through the reading plan, and for those of you that, that maybe are new and, and haven't been following along, we're going through the New Testament in a year as a church. And so, Every week, there's, there's five chapters that we read, and then we'll gather on Sunday, and we'll, we'll discuss something that we read during the course of that week. And if you haven't been following along, would encourage you to either, either download the app, go to the website, or there are some, some hard copies, some physical copies at the Welcome Center of our reading plan. Would encourage you to, to jump in where we're at today and, and follow along with us. Um, but as we were preparing and, and reading through, and you know, I'm just kind of spending time in prayer and you know, God, what do you want me to share? I was, I was all set on 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And that's what I was going to preach, how as, as Paul is, is wrapping up his, his letter to the church in Corinth, he says, um, where, let me find it here real quick, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13 is what I wanted to preach, where he says, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. I think that's a good, you know, as he's, he's wrapping up kind of his signature on this letter, he, he encourages them in this way. For 15 chapters, he's brought correction, he's brought instruction, he's answered questions. How do we live this life? Here's what it looks like. How do we engage with each other? Here's what it looks like. How do we worship together? Here's what it looks like. Hey, you're doing this. You need to stop it. I heard about this. You need to knock that off. And at the end of it all, he encourages them, be strong, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, do everything with love. And I think if, if there was an encouragement that as your pastor, I would want to give you, that would be, that would sum it up. It's a good summary of, of an encouragement from, from one whose heart is for a group of people. And so, you know, as I'm, as we're, we're leading up to this week, it's like, yes, you know, like that's what I'm going to preach. And, and that's what I feel like, you know, God would, would say. And then just through conversations and was at, at small group this week. And as we were at small group this, this week discussing the, the reading that, that we had done, we, we got into 2 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And, you know, we started having conversation. And then I started having conversation with other people. And then angels coming to me. And it's like, well, maybe, maybe there's something else that God is wanting to say. And so, so went back to God in prayer. and was like, God, you know, I felt like it was 1 Corinthians 16. Is there something else that you want me to share? And he took me to, to 2 Corinthians, and so that's where we're going to be today. As in our reading plan, we, we started Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, or at least the second letter that we have in Scripture. Many scholars believe it's actually his third letter, 
Um, but we, we start 2 Corinthians, and we're going to read verses 3 through 11. And here's what Paul writes. He says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. How many of you are thankful for God's comfort? When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we're weighed down with troubles. Anybody ever been there? Anybody there today? Anybody there right now? Just feel weighed down with troubles. He says, even when we are weighed down with troubles, it's for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things that we suffer. And I'm sure there are some that were in Corinth and maybe some that are here today that read Paul's words and it's like, but I know what Paul went through. I don't want to suffer (laughs) and endure I don't, I don't want to be able to endure what you endured, Paul. I don't want to be shipwrecked, and I don't want to be stoned, and I don't want to be beaten, and I don't want to be starving, and I don't want to be homeless, and I don't want to... I definitely don't want all of those things. Paul says, you will be able to endure like we do and endure the same suffering. Verse 7, he says, we are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort that God gives. Verse 8, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters about the trouble that we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. Verse 9, in fact, we expected to die. Now, we don't know exactly what the trouble he's discussing. We, we, we don't know for sure what it is. In the book of Acts, there are you know, there are, there are writings where when he's in Ephesus, he had to fight off some wild beasts. It, it, could, have, it could have been that. It could have been the, the persecution he faced in Ephesus or from, from other places. It could have been any, any number of things. The truth is we don't know what it is that led him to this place of expecting to die. But look at what he says. We expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves. We stopped relying on ourselves. And learn to rely only on God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. See, the song that we sang this morning, you are the same God. You were provider then, you'll provide again. You were healer then, you'll heal again. You were savior then, you'll save again. Paul says he rescued us then, and he'll rescue us again. He says we've placed our confidence in him. And he will continue to rescue us. And you are helping us by praying for us. Then many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. I want to to take from verse 9 his his statement. As a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God. This morning, I want us to talk about the sin of self-reliance. Lord, I thank you for your word today. God, I pray that over the next few moments, Lord, that you would speak through me, that these would not be my words, but your words. My word accomplishes nothing, but your word accomplishes the purpose for which you send it out. So, Lord, as your word goes forth today, I pray that it would take root in hearts. I pray that it would take root in minds. I pray, Lord, that that those that are here and those that are watching online and those that are going to watch later, Lord, I pray that your word would penetrate our hearts. We thank you that it's living, that it's active. It's not just words on a page. It's not just just text. But Lord, it's the the power of God. It's the transformational power of God as we we seek to understand your word and then seek to apply your word. Lord, I pray that you would speak to every heart and mind today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. If I were to ask you who the greatest Olympian of all time was, what would your answer be? Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens is, 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 is a great answer to that question. Sprinter um, and, and won gold medal. Who, who else? You, who, Usain? Somebody say Usain Bolt? 
Any Usain Bolt fans in the place? Any Jamaica fans? Come on. Not the bobsled team. I know we, you know, some of us, when we think about Olympics, we think of, you know, Sanka and his, his lucky egg. And, you know, <laughs> we think about the cool runnings team. Somebody said Michael Phelps. Who said Michael Phelps? All right. A couple hands go up for Michael Phelps. Any, any other answers that, that haven't been mentioned? Say that one. Eric Hyden. What did Eric Hyden do? Hockey. Speed skater? Okay, so he was a speed skater. Only speed skater I know is Apollo Ono. Anybody remember Apollo Anton Ono? Right? He was the, like, he was the guy back in the day. Uh, what else? Any, any other? Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe. Come on. <laughs> Greatest athlete that ever lived who just happened to be native. I'm not saying that that <laughs> is why he was the greatest athlete that ever lived. But, you know, you draw your own conclusions, right? <laughs> Muhammad Ali, another good one. It, 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 how, anybody know who, who has won the most medals in Olympic history? Mark Spitz. Most Olympic medals of any athlete in the history of the Olympics is Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps is the most decorated Olympian that has ever lived. In the, the four Olympic games that he competed, 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016, 28 Olympic medals Michael Phelps won. Of those 28 Olympic medals, 23 of them just so happened to be gold medals. Here's a man that has competed four times on the, the biggest stage. He's won 23 gold medals, 28 medals in total. In, in, in his prime, there was a stretch there where like he was literally unbeatable. Like if you, if you were getting in a pool with Michael Phelps, it wasn't a race for first place. It was a race to see who was going to come in second. And if you took second behind Phelps, you've done something. There was just no way that you were going to, to beat him. And, and after his athletic career, Michael Phelps, he, he ran into some trouble. He had, a, he had a rough patch, if you will. He had some of those things that Paul said, you know, I've had to endure. There are times where I thought I was going to die. And as you listen to Michael Phelps speak today, there are definitely times where he, he had to endure some things. He, uh, he's recently put out a documentary, and, and in it he interviews, you know, other athletes and other uh, Olympians talking about, you know, the, the price that they pay the sacrifice that they make to get to the highest level in whatever sport they compete in. But then what happens when it's all over? What happens when the, the ceremonies are over and the, the national anthems aren't being played and there's, there's no fanfare and there's no recognition and there's no reception? Like you just go home and then what do you do? What becomes of you? And he talks about how, you know, there was a, a period in his life where he really suffered with a deep, dark depression. And he, he would wake up every day and just, just not want to do anything. And here's a man that is celebrated more than any Olympic athlete ever. The, the man that had endorsement deals and, you know, it could, anywhere he went, he would get recognized. But he says, he says in this interview that he literally every day would sit at the edge of his bed and have thoughts about taking his own life. He just wanted it to end. He wanted to be done with it. He wanted it to be over. And so they, they asked him, well, why why did you just not speak to someone? Why didn't you talk to somebody? Why didn't you get help? Why didn't you get counseling? Why didn't you get therapy? Why, why, why was it just you? And here's what he said. He said, it's because our conviction, our as in, as in athletes, Olympians, he says, it's because of our conviction that we can make ourselves unbeatable if we just work at it. He said, it's our belief that there's no way we should ever need help from anyone. That's why I went through it alone. That's why I wouldn't talk to anyone. That's why I wouldn't ask anyone for help because for years in training for these, these events, I had gone through so much and been told so many times that if you just push yourself, if you just work harder, if you just practice longer, if you just take care of your body, if you just do these certain things, there's nobody that's going to be able to beat you. You'll never need help from anyone if you just, and maybe 
Maybe you're here today and you can empathize with going through things. You can empathize with with Paul and having to endure and feeling the weight and the pressure and the, the strain of life. Maybe you can't necessarily empathize with being an Olympic athlete. Any Olympians in here today? Okay, any YMCA rec league all-stars in here today? Come on, you can raise your hand for that. That's all right. I'm still an athlete too. Maybe we can't empathize with being an Olympian, but I think we can all empathize with that tension of, of relying on self versus having the humility to ask for help. He said there was this self-reliance ingrained in us. And I, I think it's not just Olympians that have that ingrained in them. I think we as, as Americans even, right, we, we think back hundreds of years to the founding of this country and as the, the population moved west, we have images in our minds of the cowboy on the plains who's out there just by himself, right, or the pioneers who came, came west and just took a, a stake and planted it in the ground and claimed this land for themselves. They had this this the self-reliance that they needed at that time in order to even survive. And so, you know, we pride ourselves on this self-reliance. Self-reliance looks good even on the outside. We value hard work. And our word this year is, is gritty. To be gritty is the, the unyielding determination to not give up, to not give in to not grow weary, to continue to press through, but there's this tension that exists in that between relying on ourself to develop that grit, and if we would just, and if we would just work hard enough, we have that pick yourself up by your bootstraps mentality, right? And if we could just do enough, if we could just read enough, if we could just be enough, then, then we'll get through it, and then we'll develop that grit. But, but there's this danger that exists because if we're not careful, we can tend to very often rely too much on our own selves rather than relying on God's strength and God's power. And that's what Paul is writing. He said, we went through a lot of stuff. We went through hard times. We thought we were going to die. But as a result, what did we learn? We learned to stop relying on ourselves and instead to rely on God. And what happened when we relied on God? He rescued us. He rescued us then, he'll rescue us again. He comforted us then, he'll comfort us again. He, he saved us then, he'll save us again. Whatever it is that we needed in that moment, if we, if we would just rely on God, but when we rely on ourselves, that's when we face trouble. What is, is self-reliance? This morning, as we talk about self-reliance, here's how the dictionary defines self-reliance. A reliance on one's own efforts and abilities. A reliance on one's own efforts and abilities. When you're, when you're self-reliant, you get what you can produce. And for some of us, that's more than others. For some of us, it's less than others. Self-reliance is relying on your own abilities. But God-reliance, you don't just get what you can produce. You don't get a result of your efforts. You don't get a result of your own abilities. But when you rely on God, you get what God can produce. And you get the result of his ability. And you get the result of his effort. And that's anything and everything. This morning, as we, we talk about self-reliance, the first thing that I want to, to talk about is the danger of, of self-reliance, the problem with self-reliance. And then I want to talk about the promise of God-reliance, okay? So if you're taking notes today, those are the two things we're going to be discussing. Thank you, Jenny. Two things we're going to be discussing today is the problem with self-reliance, and the promise of God reliance. And again, with self-reliance, you know, it looks good from the outside. Self-reliance feels safe, right? I don't have to depend on anyone. If I just rely on myself, I don't have to, I don't have to wait. Nobody can let me down at that point because it's just, it's just me. I don't, have to, I don't have to trust anyone because I can't trust anyone. I only have to trust myself. It feels safer. It feels easier. It's more comfortable to rely on ourselves than anyone else. It's more comfortable to rely on ourselves than it is to rely on God. How many you know relying on God takes patience? How often do you ask God for something and God says, yes, right now, I'm on it right away? <laughs> right? Like, it doesn't work that way. You ask God for something, what does he do? 
He brings you to an opportunity to develop that in your life. God, help me to have patience. <laughs> okay, great. Here's an opportunity to be patient. God, help me to be courageous. Okay, here's, here's giants in the land. Here's an opportunity to be courageous. God, help me, help me to be a good steward. Okay, here's something that you have a chance to steward. What are you going to do with it? God, God, help me to develop grit. Okay, here's some things to endure because it's through that enduring that your patience is developed. And when your patience is developed, your endurance is developed. And when your endurance is developed, then you'll be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So here's some trials. Here's some temptations. Here's some problems. Here's some hardship. God, I didn't want that kind of grit. God, I just wanted you to make me gritty. And God says, I can, and I am, and I will, if you would stop relying on yourself. See, with self-reliance, we say that we can fill that hole inside of us with stuff. Self-reliance seeks to, to fill the emptiness, and we all have that same emptiness. Right? Without Jesus in our lives, there's that, that sense that something's missing. And if I could just fill the, the longing of my soul with, with the next job or the next relationship or the bigger house or the better car or the bigger truck or the this or that, whatever the, the case may be for you. We, 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 when, we're, when we're self-reliant, we try and fill it with stuff. And so we, we become materialistic. And we say, if I just had blank, then I would be happy. We pursue happiness in all of the temporary external circumstances. When we're self-reliant, we, we search for happiness in money, sex, and status. When we're self-reliant, we get our self-worth from the, the opinions of others and what they say about us. But the danger in that is because our worth is determined by what people think about us. That leads us to be deceptive and manipulative. Because I can't let you see the real me, because if you see the real me, then you're going to think less of me. And because my worth is tied and attached to you, I have to deceive you or manipulate you to get you to think higher of me so that I think higher of me. And so this, this cycle that we get on of, of self-reliance, when we're self-reliant, we think that we can free ourselves if we just try hard enough. We search for freedom, but we're relying on ourselves. So it's always the next book, or it's always the next podcast, or it's always the next conference, or it's always the next message. And so there's this longing in us for freedom, and we recognize we need freedom, freedom from addiction and freedom from sin and freedom in our mind and freedom in our hearts, freedom in our lives. And so we're pursuing freedom, but when it's, when it's reliant upon our own abilities, you get what you can produce. I could quit if I wanted to. No, you couldn't, because if you could have, you would have. I remember telling myself that when we first got married. I'll quit when, I'll quit when, when we get married. I'll be, I won't, then I won't need that. I'll be done with that when, when, when we have kids. I'll be done with that when. I'll be done with that when. And what happens? You just continue in that. Why? Because you're relying on self. Yeah. You get what you can produce in your own ability and your own power, and that's this. So we have to stop relying on ourselves. The dictionary says it's, it's the, the, what you get from your own efforts. Here's my definition of self-reliance. My definition of self-reliance is that self-reliance is our prideful attempts to find freedom or fulfillment from external sources. It's our prideful attempts. Because self-reliance is a result of pride. It stems from pride. It's an overestimation of ourselves. Well, I could do it. I can figure it out. I can take care of it. We need provision. That's all right. I'll just get a second job. I've got it taken care of. No, don't ask for any help. No, don't, don't ask for prayers. No, don't fill out a, a, a pursuit night prayer card. We don't need prayers from anyone. I've got it figured out. I've got it handled. I've got it taken care of. Just, just trust me. You ever been there? You ever told your spouse that? Just trust me. I got it. I'm good. I promise. I'll do it. I'll figure, I'll, I'll work it out. I'll, I'll take extra hours. I promise I'll, I'll stop tomorrow. 
I promise I'm done with that. You ever told yourself that in the mirror? So those, those of you that are like, well, I'm not married. I've never told my spouse that. I wish I had a spouse to tell that to, but I don't. You ever told yourself that in the mirror? I promise this is the last time. I promise we'll find somebody that we trust that we can talk to. I promise we'll get, we'll get help one day. I promise this isn't the end. I promise we'll figure it out. We're so self-reliant, but it comes from, comes from a place of pride. Yeah. And I think we need to understand pride a little bit because pride is, you know, oftentimes when we talk about pride, we, we can so easily think of pride as this, this overinflated view of ourselves. Like, you know, we think about the prideful person and they're the person that walks around with their nose up at everybody that, you know, they're too good for everybody and, you know, that's just, that, well, that's just pride. Yes, it is. But can I tell you, that's not the only way that pride manifests right. itself. Right. It's not just somebody who thinks that they're, you know, the bee's knees or all that in a bag of chips or the best thing since sliced bread or all that, whatever, whatever generational idiom you want to put on that, right? Because I think I hit 80s, 90s, and maybe early 2000s with that one. Although bee's knees, that probably goes back even beyond that. Somebody who thinks that they're, you know, they're the stuff. That's not the only way that pride manifests itself. But pride, pride is also about self-preservation. Pride, pride also manifests itself in, in other ways. And right below the surface of pride is this, this, this foundation of fear and unbelief and doubt. And because we are fearful human beings and we are, are doubtful people, we have to mask that with this layer of pride, which manifests itself differently in different people. But if you get to the root of it, why are you, why are you so prideful? Because I'm afraid. Because there's, there's this fear. I think every sin goes back to pride. You can, you can trace the root of any sin in your life back to pride. I think pride was the, the original sin in the garden. When the, the serpent came to tempt Eve and she, he says, you know, you should eat of this fruit. No, we can't eat of that fruit because we'll die. You'll, you'll not die. God just knows that if you eat this, you'll be like him. And so there was this pride, not just because I want to be like him, but there was this pride that, well, maybe I do know better than God. Maybe God is trying to keep me from something. And so there's this conflict and, and there's this fear that I'm missing out on something. And so let me just take it. And so pride manifests itself in the garden, but it's rooted in fear. It's rooted in doubt. It's, it's rooted really in, in human weakness. As we look at the, the scriptures, we see examples of that, that everywhere, this this root of pride leading to self-reliance. You see it in Genesis chapter 16. As God has come to Abram and he's promised him a son. And, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a son and your, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And here's Abram at 75 years old thinking, how is this going to be possible? There's no, there's no way. That can't be. And so there's this season of waiting that he goes through and God's given the promise and he trusted in the promise. But after like 15 years, he's like, God, I don't know if the promise is still good. And after 20 years, God, I don't, I don't, when, when are you going to, when are you going to make good on your promise? And so his wife, Sarah comes to him and says, Abram, maybe, maybe we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't rely on God. Maybe we should just take matters into our own hands. Abram, why don't you take my servant and why don't you use her? Maybe she, maybe she could be our surrogate. And so take my servant and have a child with her. And maybe that's what God meant when he said he was going to give us his son. And so Abram says, okay, are you sure? No, I'm sure. Now, this is your idea. No, it's my idea. You're not going to be mad at me later? No, I'm not going to be mad. Like, why don't you just, just, just take, just see what happens? I'll tell you what's going to happen. And so he, he takes Hagar and goes into the tent and they have Ishmael. And there's this son that is born. And after the son is born, <laughs> there's problems. And there's problems even before he's born because his wife comes to him and says, ever since she got pregnant, she thinks she's better than me. And Sarah looks at Abraham and she says, this is all your fault. 
Read it, Genesis chapter 16, better than any soap opera you could ever watch. Take my servant. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Okay, she's pregnant. It's your fault. It wasn't even my idea. This was your idea. But then God comes and he, he answers and he gives the, the son of promise. He gives Isaac. But now there are these, these two boys. There's Ishmael and there's Isaac. Isaac, the one that God promised, and Ishmael, the one that Abraham stepped out of his reliance on God, took on self-reliance and tried to make it happen in his own efforts and his own abilities. And from that day to this, there has been a war that has been waged. And when we watch TV and when we watch the news and we see the conflict in the Middle East, can I tell you, that is all traced back to one man's bout of self-reliance and his distrust of God. All of that goes back to Isaac in Ishmael, and their descendants are still fighting to this day. Why? Because self-reliance crept in, that rather than waiting and trusting in God, we said, well, what if we just, what if we just take over? What if we just make it happen? What if we just make it work? What if we just work hard enough? What if we're just smart enough? What if we think our way out of this one? What if we just strategize? If we just had the right strategy, then we could, we could figure it all out. That's, that's self-reliance talking. You go forward and, and you look at the book of Numbers. And you know, as, as the, the people of Israel are leaving Egypt, they're heading towards the, the promised land, the land that God had promised to Abraham. And here they are hundreds of years later. They're, they're finally out of slavery. They're going into the promised land. And Moses sends out some spies into the land to see what it looks like in Numbers chapter 13. Go see what it looks like, take a trip around, and come back and give us a report. And as the spies came back, here was their report in Numbers chapter 13. They said, the land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants, the descendants of an act. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. God had promised to give them this land. God had promised to give them victory. They go and take a look for themselves and 10 of the 12 spies come back and they say, we don't stand a chance. Doesn't matter what God said. I can tell you, we don't stand a chance. We're too small. There's no way. But there were two spies, Joshua and Caleb. And they came back and in Numbers chapter 14, here's what they said to the people. Their only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Look at the two, the two differences. Here they're faced with this insurmountable challenge. This challenge of, of as, as this, this people group who's never lived free and never experienced battle and hasn't been trained. The, the challenge of going into a foreign land with, with fortified cities, with, with armies and with giants in the land and to conquer and to take over the land that God had promised to give them. That was the challenge. And for 10 of them, they looked at it and they looked at themselves and they said, there's no way that I can do this. I don't stand a chance. But for the other two, they said, it's not about what we can do, but the Lord is with us. It's not a result of our abilities or, or our strength or our power or our might. It's a result of God's strength and his power and his might. Stop trusting in yourself and looking at your own weakness, but instead look at God's might and look at God's power. And with God, we can do anything because it's not about us. When you face challenges in your life, which one are you more like? Because your response to challenges will tell you, it will lie on you. It will tell you where you put your trust and where you put your hope. When you face a hard situation or a hard season or an opportunity to develop grit is your first instinct, man, there's no way, like this is impossible. Then what that tells you is you're relying too much on yourself. But if you face a hard situation and your response is, man, God's going to get a lot of glory out of this one. Because I don't see a way out, but God, with you, there's always a way. With me and with man, it's, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. 
Man, this is a a big giant in my way, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Man, God, I don't know how you're gonna work this out by your providence, but I know it's gonna be for my good and your glory, according to Romans chapter eight. God, God, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I'm thankful that I don't have to go through this alone. When you face challenges and that is your response, it tells you you're not relying on self, but instead you're relying on God. We see it in the, the spies, see The problem with self-reliance is this, that self-reliance will always maximize your weaknesses and it will minimize God's goodness. Will always maximize, it will always put a, a magnifying glass on how you can't do it. And it will always decrease God's promises and his provision, his goodness. His comfort. There's a scripture in Jeremiah chapter 17 that, you know, there, there's, there's verses in the Old Testament, and verses in the prophets that we quote often. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, give you hope and a future and an expected end from the prophet of Jeremiah. And then there's some, some, some passages from the prophets that, you know, we don't quote as often, right? Like, that was a prophecy for a people, certain people at a certain time. That prophecy is not for me. I don't, don't want to receive that one. But there are, are passages in the, the Old Testament that I think speak to this, this tendency for us as humans. And this isn't just for, for Israel thousands of years ago, but for us as God's creation, for us as humanity. This tension of knowing knowing we should trust God and wanting to trust God, but when the rubber meets the road, there's this tension of the unknown. Of man, if I, if I really rely on God, it's going to require me to take my hands off the steering wheel of my life. And that's a, a terrifying proposition because I don't know what's gonna happen. And if I truly, you know, carry Underwood this thing and Jesus take the wheel, then I don't, I don't know what's going to happen next. And and because I don't know what's going to happen next, let me just stay, let me just stay in control and 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 try and bear it out, try and white knuckle my way through life. There's this tension, wanting to rely on God, but but almost needing to rely on self. Because we're so prideful and because we like control and The fear of the unknown is too much for us. But in Jeremiah chapter 17, there's this passage of scripture. Go ahead and put that scripture up there. Here's what the prophet says. Cursed are those. How many of you guys want to be cursed? Not a single hand. Okay, just making sure. Cursed are those. Now, understand, in the Old Testament, when you see curse, okay? Like even Deuteronomy 28, as they're getting ready to go in, God says, if you do this, you'll be blessed. If you don't do this, you'll be cursed. It's not that God is actively speaking curses against you. But to be cursed is a removal of God's hand of favor and grace upon your life. So it's not that God is cursing you. He's just removing his blessing. So the opposite of blessing is curse. So God is either actively blessing you or he's actively removing his blessing, which leads you to a place of being cursed, okay? Just want to make sure we're all on the same page that God doesn't curse you, but he removes his favor and his grace from your life. Cursed are those. So again, who wants to be cursed? Good. Cursed are those who what? Put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. As you read this, you'll see what are the results of self-reliance. Number one is unfaithfulness to God. A, a, an over-reliance on yourself will lead you away from God. Cursed on though, they turn their hearts away from the Lord. They're like stunted shrubs in the desert. There's no growth. There's a barrenness. You're, you're, you, could, you, could be, you could be coming to church for 20 years, but as you look back on your life, how much growth has been present along the way? Where are you today compared to where you were 20 years ago? If you're the same stunted shrub, then maybe you're relying too much on yourself. If you're still in this dry place, maybe there's an over-reliance on self rather than a reliance on God. He says there's stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. 
There's a hopelessness in your life. You might be relying on self. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited, salty land. Reason some of you guys are so salty. You just walk around salty at everybody. Is because you're relying on self, which leads you to a place of barrenness, which leads you to an uninhabited land. What is that? That's lonely. Nobody wants to be around that. Nobody wants to hang out with that. Nobody wants to spend time with that. Nobody wants to date that. Why can't I get a date? You're too salty. You need some sugar. You need to sweeten it up a little bit. How do we get that? Stop relying on yourself. Submit yourself and surrender yourself to him. Stop going through this life hopeless, dry, stunted, without growth, without fruit, no life, not producing anything. Where does that come from? It comes from those who trust in mere humans. When we rely on ourselves, God says through the prophet Jeremiah, here's the life that it leads to. And too many Christians are living this life. We're experiencing and we're living through the problem of self-reliance. It's this, this emphasizing our weakness while minimizing God's goodness. What's the antidote? The antidote to the problem of self-reliance is to recognize and walk in the promise of God-reliance. If, if we would rely on God rather than relying on self, and that's the truth. The truth is there's a better way. That we don't have to stay salty. We don't have to stay stunted and unfruitful. But the, the prophet Jeremiah, he continues. The very next verse, remember, Cursed are those who rely on mere humans. Then he says, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord. How many want to be blessed? How many want to be cursed? How many want to be blessed? How many want to be cursed? How many want to be blessed? Okay, we better figure out how to be there. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and their confidence. Now look at the difference. Remember, those that were self-reliant are stunted shrubs living in a barren wasteland with no hope for the future and they're lonely and they're salty and nobody likes them. Verse eight, those who put their confidence, their hope in the Lord, they're like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. What is that? That's refreshing. That's renewal. That's life. That's comfort. That's hope. That's joy. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. That's protection, that's provision, that's safety. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. That's life, it's fruitfulness, it's the fruit of the spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, the self-control that we all need and we're all searching and we're all trying to produce in our lives. And the truth is you can try and do it yourself and rely on what you can do. And you, you, might, you might have seasons where you can increase happiness, but there's no real joy. There might be seasons where you can, you can force a little fruit to happen. And it's like, oh, look at how cute that was, but it went away so fast. Or you can be like a tree planted by the stream and allow God's presence to bring life. Rather than relying on self in this dry and barren wasteland, we can rely on, on God and we can, we, can, we can get what God produces in our lives. God reliance says, I can't be the source of my provision, my healing, my freedom, my comfort, my defense, or my protection. I can't do those things. That's not my role. It's not my job. I'm not good at it. I'm unqualified. And when I do that, I just mess it up. When I try and be my source, I mess it up. But when I try and make somebody else my source, they mess it up. If I try and make Angel my source of happiness and contentment, she gets it wrong. Doesn't happen. Don't work that way. When, when I try to make Angel my source of joy, it doesn't happen. When I try to make her my source of healing, it doesn't happen. When we try and put the, 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 the job and the responsibility of God onto ourselves or other people, we will always let ourselves and each other down because we can't do those things. But when we go to God and say, God, I need healing, would you heal me? 
God will heal you from the inside out. God, I need freedom. Would you set me free? He came to set the captives free and to release prisoners from, from bondage. That's what he does. God, would you restore? Would you reconcile? That's his specialty. Stop trying to do it on your own, but instead learn to trust in God and rely on him. See, self-reliance makes us feel hopeless in our circumstances, but when we rely on God, he's our hope in all circumstances. Self-reliance paralyzes us in fear. God-reliance overcomes those fears. First John chapter four. Self-reliance causes us to be unbelieving. We only trust what we can see, but God-reliance exercises our faith in God and we see what he can do and what he can produce in our lives. See, the, the promise of God-reliance is that if we would just humbly trust in God, if we would put our pride to the side, stop trying to produce it on our own, but we would come to this place of saying, God, I'm stepping off the, the throne of my heart. I'm, I'm letting go of that steering wheel. I don't even want to sit shotgun. I'll sit, I'll sit in the back. You can, you can put me in the trunk. I don't care what you go, what you, where you take me, what you want to do, but Lord, have your way. When we humble ourselves to that point, then God will comfort. He comforted then, he'll comfort again. He will rescue. He will protect. He will provide. Whatever it is you need in that moment, he's able to do, but not until you give him control. It's when you give him the keys. It's when you give him permission. You got his is standing at the door and he's knocking. He's not going to burst through your door. It's not like Steven Seagal in a 90s action movie where he comes in and just like, you're just chilling in your living room one day and boom, like all of a sudden. Or maybe, maybe that reference is lost on you and you've never seen a Steven Seagal movie and that's fine. Maybe he's like the Kool-Aid man in your, in your picture just comes busting through the wall, right? Oh yeah, no, like that's not cool. God doesn't do that. He's not just gonna bust through the wall of your life. What's he gonna do? He's gonna do this. I see you struggling and I'm here to help. There's healing that you need in your heart and I can help. You've been trying to find freedom in that area, and I'm here. You're looking for fulfillment and acceptance and approval and validation. Stop looking in those other things and let me welcome you into my family. Stop. Can you, I, I, I can see you. I know you're there. You ever knocked on the, the door of a house and you know that they're home, but they're just ignoring you? <laughs> Not like the worst feeling. Like, I can hear you inside there. Hello. So many of us are hiding behind the couch and God's at the door knocking. And it's like, but if I open the door, I don't know what he's going to ask me to do. If I open the door, I don't know what that is going to look like. It's going to look like freedom. It's going to look like fulfillment. It's going to look like peace. It's going to look like the provision you've been asking for. The answer to your prayers and the answers to your longing is standing at the door of your heart knocking. The question is, when are you going to open the door? Proverbs chapter three, trust in the Lord. Acknowledge him. He will direct your path. But it's this, this God reliance that we need when we stop relying on self and start relying on him. So how do I produce that in my life? Real quick, I'm gonna give you five things. You're gonna wanna write these things down and then I'm gonna pray for you and then we're gonna get out of here, all right? How do I develop God reliance in my life? The first one is this. You have to know his promises. I think the reason why so many of us, it's so hard, and can we capitalize this G for next service? I just noticed that. But the reason why so many of us, it's so hard for us to trust God is because we don't know what his word says. We don't know his character. It's hard for us to trust somebody that we don't know, right? Like, I'm not going to give you the keys to my truck if I don't know you. And some of you, I'm not going to give you the keys to my truck because I do know you. But that's neither here nor there. I think, I think sometimes when God comes and he asks us to give us the keys to, to our lives, it's like, well, I don't know you and I don't know that I can trust you. And if you would just know the promises in his word that he is for you and he is not against you that he wants to bless you. He doesn't want to, to curse you, but he wants to have his hand of favor upon you and he wants to watch over you and he wants to protect you and he goes before you and he goes behind you and he'll, he'll lead you and he'll guide all of those promises. 
If we would just know his character and know what his word says, it would be easier for us to say, okay, get to know his promises. The second thing we have to do is we have to test his promises. Malachi says, test me in this. See if I won't. The promise is if you're obedient, I'll provide. Try it. See what happens. The next time you you face an opportunity for growth or an opportunity to be gritty or an opportunity to be courageous or an opportunity to be generous. See, God will never just produce these things or create you, create these things in your life. He'll give you opportunities to practice it. So the next time you find yourself with an opportunity to be patient, to be generous, to be gritty, to be faithful, to be God-reliant, Test him in his promises. Okay, God, here's what your word says. I'm gonna try it and see what happens. The more you test his promises, the more you find his promises to be true. And because you jumped and landed first time, you can jump and land again. We have to know his promises. We have to test his promises. The third thing you need to do is you need to pray his promises. Speak his promises over yourself, over your kids, over your family, over your future, over your situation, over what you're facing. Whatever the case may be, pray those promises. Number four, we have to trust his promises. Can't trust him without knowing him. Can't know him without spending time with him. Do you know him to the point where you can trust him? And then number five, the fifth thing that we have to do is we have to rest in his promises. So many of us, we face things in our lives and because we're so reliant on self, because we're so prideful, which is really a way of saying we're so fearful. We get so worked up and we get so worried and we get so anxious. The opposite of rest is worry. Jesus in Matthew chapter six said, don't worry about anything. Worry for nothing. If God provided for the, for the flowers and God takes care of the, the bird, like how much more will he provide for you? How much more will he clothe you? How much more will he take care of you? God knows what you have need of even before you ask. But if you would seek first his righteousness, then all these things would be added unto you. So you have a choice. Like yes, gritty is hard and yes, gritty is going to take work and And this this is not to absolve ourselves of any responsibility. But the choice is, where is your hope and where is your confidence placed? You can choose to either rest or you can choose to worry. It all depends on where you put your confidence this morning. Stand with me if you would. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness, your mercy, and your grace, your character that, God, we can trust in you. We can rely on you. We don't have to rely on self, but today, Lord, we we declare our dependence on you, our need for you. Lord, for those that are here today that maybe they've been trusting in themselves or depending on themselves, relying on themselves for their own salvation. And if I'm just a good enough person at the end of it all, then then maybe I can work my way into heaven. And Lord, it leads to a, a life of anxiety and worry. Lord, we thank you that there's a better way, that you sent your son to live the life we never could, to pay the price that we all owed, that if we would just place our faith in Jesus and accept him as our Lord, that our names could be written into the book of life and we could be adopted into your family and have the hope of eternal life with you. So Lord, today I pray that you would draw the hearts of of all men, all women, all young people to yourself. This morning, if you're here and that's you and you say, I've been trusting in myself, even for my own salvation, and I'm exhausted, I'm tired, I don't wanna do it anymore. If you would just call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says that you would be saved. And so, Lord, today, we can collectively, we repent of our sin. We confess we are sinners in need of a Savior. We thank you that you save. You saved back then, and God, you save us today, and you will save us tomorrow. 
Lord, forgive us for relying on ourselves and teach us to rely on you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 God bless you. At Dream City Omaha, we're all about helping each other do three things. Discover Christ, recover identity, and uncover purpose. Please check out our past sermon series or online discipleship classes. And don't forget to hit subscribe and the bell for notifications on all of our latest videos.